Hello, this is your host, Jennifer Baker, and welcome to the Human Brain Project podcast, where we talk to the scientists and researchers that have dedicated their lives to solving the mysteries of the human brain. We discover the humans behind the science and find out how tomorrow's discoveries will be shaped. Today we're talking to Igit Musk Knudsen, a professor at the University of Copenhagen and the chair of the Human Brain Project Science and Infrastructure Advisory Board. We'll be talking with her about psychedelics and neuropharmacology. Thanks for joining us. A very good morning to you. Um, perhaps we could start by talking a little bit about the work you're doing at the moment. Explain to our audience what it is that you are focusing on with the human brain. So my key passion uh, at the moment, uh, and it's been so for a while, is to study how drugs uh, influence the brain and to predict um, which patients are going to benefit from from certain types of interventions. And um, and that is what we also call precision medicine. More specifically, we are uh, at my research lab, uh, currently investigating the effects of psilocybin and other psychedelics. A very interesting, um, uh, these, these drugs have very interesting effects on the brain, particularly because just one single dose of these compounds can have lasting effects uh, in, for instance, treatment of depression. And I mean, what do you wish the general public knew more about what you're working on? Because psychedelics, I guess it's something we think of as more uh, a party drug or, or something that's not necessarily used for therapeutic use. I think it's important for the public to know that today we have um, research tools uh, that allow us to investigate the brain in a much more thorough manner than we used to. Uh, and obviously, uh, psychedelics is a field that interestingly uh, has divided people uh, a lot, I found. Uh, either people tend to think that psychedelics can cure in everything um, and that they are the answer to virtually any brain disorder, um, or they are very scared of uh, the thought of the mere thought of, of using psychedelics for, for any a kind of uh, therapeutic purpose. And what sort of tools do you use uh, in your investigatory work? So um, in my lab, we use uh, neuroimaging tools, uh, including molecular neuroimaging with positron emission tomography, which we also abbreviate as PET, uh, or single photon emission tomography, abbreviated as SPECT. Uh, and then we use magnetic resonance uh, imaging for um, measuring both structural and functional aspects uh, of the brain. And what sort of questions do you get asked the most, um, either by other researchers in different fields or, or just by people in general about your work? Well, it depends, obviously. Um, what people are asking depends, obviously, on, on the topic uh, and that, that we are debating. Um, Many people are interested, I would say lay people are mostly interested in how can you identify a cure for uh, brain disorders uh, and mental disorders, obviously, is a, is a very large uh, part of brain disorders. Um, and then there is the discussion about um, the duality of the brain and the body. Uh, do we have a soul? Uh, do we uh, have a brain? And People also sometimes find that the thought or the mere thought of the brain being uh, the organ that is governing everything is um, it's a strange one. So um, that is, of course, something that uh, we need to discuss more with the public. I think what is the division between the soul and the brain, if any? And I'm, of course, as a neurobiologist and a neurologist, I'm, of course, a strong believer that we are our brains and uh, good for that. So we have something to work with there. Well, this is something that comes up a lot in these podcasts on the Human Brain Project. It's certainly one of the most fascinating areas. And I'm interested, is this an area that you always thought you would work in? Was there something that triggered you in your childhood or maybe family members or, or somebody who influenced you to, to decide to work in this area? 
Well, I wouldn't say I decided to work on the brain as a child. Um, I think I had uh, other ideas for my future career. Uh, but um, uh, but as I started medical school, uh, I um, I got really interested in the brain and I knew that, that this was potentially one of the areas that I would like to work in. Not necessarily as a researcher, I didn't really think too much about that, but uh, not at that time at least, but um, but definitely th the brain was a very intriguing area and, and it continues to be because there's still so many unresolved mysteries about the brain that that we need to examine and we can go on for a very long time. And at what point was it that the uh, the research into psychedelics became something you were curious about? I've always worked with the serotonin system of the brain. Or when I say always, means during my active career as a neuroscientist, this has been one of the areas uh, that I have particularly focused on. Um, uh, in my lab, we have uh, studied this brain serotonin system for um, 20 years or so. Uh, and one of uh, the receptors that we were particularly interested in is the serotonin 2A receptor, uh, where we have developed uh, a particular agonist radioligand, which means that we can image that receptor in humans uh, while they are still uh, alive um, in a fairly non-invasive manner. Uh, and actually, as it turns out, uh, these classical psychedelics, they work by stimulating the serotonin 2A receptor. So it was a quite natural uh, development for me to study uh, the psychedelics. So uh, it seems like a quite a, an, if you like, organic uh, development of, of a career path. Were there any particular challenges that you had to overcome along the way or that you sort of look back on and say, I, I wish I'd done that differently or or any areas that you kind of think I could have gone in a different direction, um, but I'm glad I chose this path? Well, yes, of course, you can always consider what would have happened if you had done things differently. Um, I think one of the major turns in my career probably was at the stage where I realized that I hadn't really subspecialized within my clinical speciality, which is neurology. I had kind of been carried through different subspecialities, including stroke, epilepsy, and dementia. Um, and uh, in the final stage of my clinical career, I was even put uh, on neuromuscular disorders. And I think um, if I had taken a more straight path, so to speak, clinically, I might have ended up in a more clinical area. As of now, I am more uh, a neurobiologist. Uh, I don't see patients uh, anymore. And uh, and that could have been a different career, I'd say. Um, not to say that I regret anything, because I think uh, my career has been uh, a wonderful one. It's been a wonderful journey um, to see how these methods have developed and to be a part of uh, a field where you get to know other colleagues internationally and you get to collaborate with people. That is uh, a, a great joy, I would say, to speak to uh, really well-informed people and to discuss your ideas, but of course also to disseminate what do we know. So I often choose to, uh, to give lectures to the public uh, and to give interviews because I think it's important that we... Uh, make it clear where are we uh, with our research. And after all, um, many of our research projects are paid by public funding. So we also need to pay back. And what role has the Human Brain Project played? So uh, for the Human Brain Project, uh, I have been ha having the pleasure of uh, chairing uh, the Scientific uh, Advisory and Infrastructure Board uh, which has now run for, uh, I think, uh, five years or so. And um, through that capacity, I have uh, had, you know, great pleasure in seeing how the project has developed and to hear about the progress of the project. I should say, uh, in to, to a modest degree, being able to give some advice together with my colleagues on the board on how to proceed and make sure that other project was on track. And what 
If you had to say one thing, what does success look like in your field? What are your aspirations going forward? What would you say this has been a huge achievement or, or what sort of, uh, you know, what, what might be a wonderful practical outcome of your research? I think a wonderful outcome of my research and also of other people's research is really the precision medicine where we can predict and um, treat patients uh, according to uh, their individuality. So what we know now is that people are extremely different. Um, it's easier to do a laboratory experiment with mice that are genetically identical and where you can uh, standardize uh, all the conditions. We people are completely different. We have a different genetic makeup. Uh, we have different environmental influences uh, that make us prone to um, to not be responding to the types of interventions. When I say interventions, that means it could be either drugs or psychotherapy or some sort of um, external stimulation. Uh, so that um, I think that is one of the key challenges we have when it comes to brain disorders. Um, on a more high level um, perspective, I would say that our largest challenge now is to understand the brain even better. How does it function? How do the different parts of the brain work together? And I think we are getting better and better tools for investigating the brain. So in the end, we will succeed to get at least to understand the brain at a whole different level than we do today. I mean, I have to say, I think that's a very common theme that we're hearing from all the scientists within the Human Brain Project. So I'm interested to know how important is cross-collaboration? Because uh, there's so many scientists that we will hear from in this podcast, but all working on slightly different areas. What is the level of importance of synergies between you? So, for example, you're working with psychedelics, somebody else might be working with mapping. How do you all fit together? And is that important in order to have the sort of breakthroughs you would like to see? I think there is a high need for interdisciplinarity. Um, and interdisciplinarity means that people have big different backgrounds. They can do different things. Um, for instance, in, in my lab, we have psychologists, we have engineers, we have medical doctors, we have pharmacologists, we have people who know about imaging, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, so I think that is an important aspect of doing science today, but I think what is just as important is to have the collaboration with scientists who are working on uh, topics that are related to your own field. So for instance, you mentioned brain mapping, that's also part of what we do. And, and I think the importance of the Human Brain Project has also been to establish uh, the uh, not just the collaboration as such, but what is much more important for a good co collaboration is probably the trust that you can uh, cultivate uh, in such uh, a big project, that you cultivate trust between research groups that you know you can trust, you know you can turn to if you have difficulties with your project or if you need good advice. Uh, or if uh, perhaps the other group um, has a better technology that could uh, help your research question evolve. So I think it, all in all, I think what the collaborations are important for is um, asking questions that can then be echoed by other scientists within the field, but not necessarily doing exactly the same thing as you do. Well, you mentioned advice there. I'm wondering what advice would you give to young scientists or if you're like the next generation of scientists? It's a very important question, this one about young scientists and how we can um, help them uh, with their careers. Uh, if we do not help the young scientists um, to uh, go into science and to stay in science, uh, it's going to be uh, a lost case, I would say. So I really worthy any effort that can help a young scientist uh, um, along their way and in their careers. So usually the, the, the advice I would give to young scientists in my laboratory or to anyone else who's interested in listening would be to say that don't be afraid of reaching out to um, 
skilled senior people within the field. You will discover that they are there, they are listening, they are generally um, wanting to help you, uh, and you can learn a lot by speaking to uh, senior scientists. I know that um, many um, early career scientists can be a bit starstruck uh, if they meet someone who um, is a very reputable scientist and they are afraid of asking silly questions. Uh, but I would say I wish I had been reaching out more when I was younger uh, and utilized uh, the experience and the help you can get from more senior scientists. And it's, it's a slightly downbeat question, but what concerns you most in the world at the moment, either with regard to science going forward or more generally? There are plenty of things to worry about in the world as such, but I don't know if you meant to ask uh, when it comes to brain research more gen or more generally. Well, both, because I suppose we see a scientist and researchers, scientists in particular, as being part of an overall effort for the public good. And I wonder if you see your work as, as part of a shared working together for something positive for humanity. I think I believe that um, that investigating the brain uh, is what we need to do in order to try to find cures for the many, many uh, neurological and psychiatric uh, uh, diseases that are out there. Uh, so these uh, brain disorders are, are the most costly uh, of all disorders. Um, and, and I think this is certainly something that can help humanity to cure some of, of the worst disorders we can think of, including Alzheimer's, but also uh, disorders that that are um, uh, involving people that at a way younger age. And here, many of the mental disorders are obviously, um, yeah, they, are, they constitute a large part of that problem. Well, they're scary. I mean, I think everybody is is a little bit afraid of some of or one of or all of these sorts of illnesses. I mean, presumably that is something you feel is a little bit of a pressure on you. I think there is some stigma around brain disorders that uh, are important to discuss and to bring out in the open. Uh, I would say that the situation has improved a lot over the last decades. Um, the mere fact that we now have treatment to offer uh, people with dementia uh, helped a lot, I think, um, because before it was considered like a kind of almost normal aging mm -hmm. that people lost their memory. And um, it was also seen an embarrassing thing uh, that people got demented. Uh, but the fact that all of a sudden there was a tablet you could take or a capsule that would help you improve, even though it was just a slight improvement. I think that was a big game changer, uh, actually, that all of a sudden people realized, well, I'm taking medicine. This is a disease that I have and I'm not responsible for this. So I think that was very helpful for destigmatizing uh, the dementia disorders. Absolutely, I think that's uh, it's one of those one of those joys of talking to people like yourself on these podcasts is that we hear some success stories like this. Um, a, a more optimistic question: If I had a magic wand and there was no restriction on funding or or resources, is there a particular research question that you would like to tackle further, or a new direction you would like to go in? This is this is also a classic question that you can be asked. You know, if you had all the funding in the world. But I think that, that really pursuing uh, how drugs affect the brain and the neurotransmission, those are the big main areas that are interesting. And in particular, the psychedelics because of the impact on consciousness. Another big theme in the Human Brain Project is, as it is, um, because we can learn a lot from these observations in, in how the brain works by doing interventions and examining uh, these very profound effects. And we can also, with the psychedelics, learn something about how a single um, psychedelic session has such sustained effects. Uh, and that is very unique for any compound. So uh, understanding how the environment, uh, pharmaceutical influences like psychedelics 
can all of a sudden change the brain um, in a uh, more permanent manner, uh, that is a really important research question that I think is worthwhile to pursue. Well, finally, then, uh, a more an optimistic question as well about yourself. What do you do for fun? What what relaxes you or, or re-energizes you when you're not working? Uh, well, my kids always tell me that I should have um, a hobby. I don't have any particular hobbies because my job is really my hobby. And uh, But, I mean, what I do to relax would be typically to... Um, take my bike and ride my bike, do physical exercises. That's, uh, it's, it's relaxing. It's, uh, you feel wonderful afterwards. It's good for your brain too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also enjoy, of course, uh, being with my family and, uh, and uh, going to museums and traveling, all these things that, um, that bring you new experiences. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's what I enjoy a lot. Well, thank you very much. I've certainly enjoyed speaking to you today and I'm sure our audience will have enjoyed listening to the, at least to whet our appetite to find out more about your project and the Human Brain Project as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Human Brain Project podcast. If so, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating. And most importantly, share with a friend. To learn more about the Human Brain Project, please visit humanbrainproject.eu and be sure to check out other episodes in this series packed with fascinating insight into how our minds work. Thanks for listening.